that. So there's a part of the brain called the hypothalamus and it's very, very, very old. We share it with virtually every animal that has a nervous system. It's, it's, it's sits above the spinal cord. It's extremely old, evolutionarily speaking, and half of it governs fundamental motivation. So it governs hunger, for example. So if you're hungry, you posit the existence of something that will satiate your appetite, a peanut butter sandwich, and then you're happy when you're moving towards the kitchen. And then maybe you get thirsty and the hypothalamus does that. And then maybe you need to use the washroom and maybe you're too hot. And that the hypothalamus pops up these little motivational frames and then emotions modulate your movement towards the goal that's established by these fundamental motivations. But that's only half the hypothalamus. The other half is the origin of the dopaminergic system that mediates exploratory striving and positive emotion. And so the way our brains are set up way below what way below the neocortex, way, way older than that. The default position is if you're satiated in all the important dimensions, then you're curious and explore. Well, why? Well, because you might find new resources that could be used to, to, to uh, uh, satiate those fundamental motivations in the future. So that heroic drive into the unknown is unbelievably archaic. And then it's regulated by fear and pain, you know, so you go into the unknown. Well, you don't want to die. So if you get damaged, you experience pain and you want to avoid pain. So you experience anxiety. These are very fundamental systems and they are reflected in our narratives. That's essentially, as far as I can tell, why the dragon hoards treasure everywhere. The dragon is an amalgam of predatory stimuli and, and fire, which is a destructive force, but also very useful. So dragon is something like predatory destructive entity. And you might say, well, is that real? It's like, well, yeah, but it's a meta category. It's like there are lions and raptors and um, lizards, let's say uh, 60 million years ago when we were st still in trees. The idea that there's a meta predator is a great idea. A meta predator is what all predators share in common. That's a dragon. Well, what should you do with a dragon? Well, avoid it. That's one answer. Another answer is burn it out of its lair so that it doesn't have baby dragons. The, and the, uh, uh, an even more sophisticated answer is, well, confront it. You can feed your family with the body of a dragon. It's treasure. And then that's become abstracted up into the unknown as such. You do a great job of uh, telling the story of Tiamat, Marduk, all of that in a way where you regrounded it in the um, actual historical context. Because they talk about when you slay the dragon, you can actually build things from it. And they talk about the from its pieces, right? Heaven and earth were yeah, made it's from amazing. it. Yeah, amazing. I thought, wow, it's kind of interesting. And then you said, no, 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 they actually used to build the you know the doorways to their cave or whatever from the bones of the animals that they slayed and I thought oh my god when you put the story in that context of you're telling the tribe something that they're actually doing but you're elevating it and so you're saying look the great hero goes and slays the most dangerous of the most dangerous predatory thing and from that we're not just creating our house we're creating the heaven and the earth and I thought whoa like you really do so I'm gonna that's why in Christianity which is, has taken the hero myth in a, in a tremendously sophisticated direction, Christ tackles the worst of all potential dragons, and that's the adversary. That's the evil in the human heart. It's become completely psychologized by that point, or spiritualized, instead of an external monster that's the threat. And let's make no mistake, external monsters are, the, are threatening. But then there's the ex external monsters that are other tribes, well, those are genuinely threatening too. And we can demonize a member of another tribe at the drop of a hat. But then you take one level above that even, you think, well, the most dangerous thing of all is the evil that lurks in the human heart, in the individual. And that's why you have the battle, let's say, between Christ and Satan. That's what that means. It's not all it means, but that's what it means. And, and so what do you, and then you ask yourself, like you can ask yourself this question very seriously. If you were thinking about the most moral possible action, wouldn't that be 
the voluntary constraint of the evil that you yourself are likely to do. And wouldn't that mean facing human evil in its reality as it manifests itself inside you? And wouldn't that mean then obtaining victory over that? And you might say, well, is that a divine story? Well, it's the, it, I can't say what the relationship is between the human psyche and, and the world as such. But we don't have a deeper story than that. And I can't see how it's not true. And you might say, well, it's not true for me. It's like, well, don't you have a conscience? Doesn't it bother you? And then can you control it? And the answer to that is almost inevitably no. It calls you to account. And why? Well, because you've deviated from the ideal. Whose ideal? An ideal that's making itself known within you, at least in so far as the objection arises. You wake up at three in the morning and torture yourself for your inequities. And you would think, well, I could just shut that off. It's me after all. But you can't shut it off. You're nothing compared to your conscience. Now, it's strange because you can ignore it. You can not live according to its dictates, but it's not going to leave you alone. Jordan, you asked the Times person uh, in the full length article or the full length recording, which I listened to, you said, hey, don't focus on my illness in this. Focus on why people resonate with my message, which she, of course, did not. Uh, but that leaves no one does. Oh, it leaves me an opening. That, I'm going to take so it right now. It's so, so interesting to see that is that it's so interesting because, you know, the only time that ever gets addressed is by, by the mainstream media. Jesus, you know, a horrible cliche, but it's usually sort of brushed off. And it's usually, well, he seems to be attractive towards young men who are troubled. Well, first of all, that's not so bad, is it? I mean, hypothetically, the most ardent feminist is primarily concerned with helping the troubled young man not be so troubled. But it's brushed off in a cynical sort of way. And it, it, the cynicism is also disbelief that that could possibly be serious. A serious enterprise. Well, I think it's a serious enterprise. Why do you it's think they resonate serious. with you? I think it's because who knows the final answer to anything, you know, but I took what I learned about what happened in the Second World War seriously. It's like, wow, we can be really bad. We should do something about that. Like that was unacceptable. Well, was it or not? Well, how unacceptable?